So thank you for the invitation. Uh, it seems a little bit strange to meet some of my colleagues from New York by flying to Texas, but that's geography for you. I was a postdoc at Ohio State for a while, and so it's an honor to be at a conference uh, in honor of Zassen Haus. So what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about some problems in number theory, which are a little bit related to group theory, and end with some questions that I have that I'm hoping people in the audience can give me some advice on, which I will then pass on to my students. So I have 17 students working with me in person this summer and another 20 to 40 online. So I really need a lot of help. So please listen, please give me some advice as to what we can do. So we like to study prime numbers. We like to study a lot of things related to them. Um, I hopefully not gonna need to do too much motivation in an audience like this as to why we care about problems like this, but you know, can we show that there are infinitely many primes, infinitely many primes in arithmetic progression? Can we show that there are more primes and whatever we mean by more that are congruent to three mod four than one mod four? And so there's a lot of questions you can ask. And it turns out these questions are related to zeros of the Riemann zeta function or more generally zeros of L functions. And it turns out the more you know about the zeros, the more you can say about problems like this. So if you just know that the Riemann zeta function has no zeros with real part equal to one, that gives you the main term of the prime number theorem. If you start knowing some region where it has no zeros, then you get error terms. If you start knowing the grand simplicity hypothesis, which assumes that these zeros are algebraically independent, because how could there be a relationship? Then you start getting Chebyshev's bias that most of the time there are more primes three mod four, and so on and so on. So a lot of problems in number theory, the more you know about the zeros, the more you can say. So we wanna to try to find ways to model the zeros of L functions to get information about them. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna show you that we see very similar behavior in many very different systems in mathematical physics, in number theory, in group theory, and I wanna discuss some of the tools and techniques. So the general approach is very similar for all these different problems. How you do the calculations is gonna be specific to whatever subject you do. Random matrix theory is a lot easier than number theory uh, in terms of just the algebra you need to do. I will then talk a little bit about some special operations you can do with L functions and combine them and get new L functions. And there's a lot of things we can say about the resulting zeros. It turns out zeros of L functions are well modeled by eigenvalues of matrices. And there's a way to figure out which matrices model which L functions. And I am hoping you can help me try to figure out which matrices should model this purely number theory operation, if there really is. I actually gave this to one of my thesis students a couple of years ago. Um, because he was very smart, and I knew if he was not able to get anything, we could always shift halfway through the year to something else. We shifted. And so we weren't able to find what the analog would be, but I'm hoping, again, that somebody here might be able to. All right. So general, what do I study in my life? I look at waiting times between events. So you have some sequence of events, and I want to know how long do I have to wait for the next one. My wife is a professor of marketing, so she would study waiting times and lines at places like Disney. And so Disney is extremely intelligent. They'll give you a little red card every now and then if you're in line. And then when you get to the front of the line, they scan it and they know how long it takes the red card to move to the top. That's how they can constantly and very cheaply just update its 45 minutes from here and have really good estimates. So lots of applications as to why we care about how long do we have to wait before something interesting happens. So there's three general things we need to be able to do to get results. We have to figure out what is the correct scale to study our system. We need to create some kind of explicit formula that takes what we want to study and converts it to something that we're able to study. And then we need some kind of averaging formula that allows us to actually calculate on the side we can do things. It's not always easy to figure out just what is the right statistic to look at what's going to be amenable to analysis. So out of curiosity, has anybody here ever seen classical random matrix theory? All right, so I see two hands, I will put mine up. So I was actually trained as a nuclear physicist by an experimentalist who was sick and tired of having on the order of 100 to 1,000 data points if he was lucky. He goes, wait, you can get billions of zeros in an afternoon in number theory? All right, let's, and so I've learned to speak number theory with a physics accent. I will try to explain the conversion later. All right, so classical mechanics, if you have just one point mass in the universe, it's trivial. Two point masses under gravity, trivial. Three point masses, we can't write down a closed form solution. So imagine how much worse it is with something like uranium with over 200 protons and neutrons. And so Vigna's great insight was to basically try to come up with a way to attack something like this. 
Now you could try to write down the fundamental equation. So you have some all the way to H, it has the energy eigenstates, cyan, and then En are the energy eigenvalues. This is similar to a linear algebra problem that you might give your students. You know, I wanna find the eigenvalues of this operator with two twists. The first is H is infinite by infinite. And normally we don't do that in a linear algebra class. And the second is we don't know any of its entries. So we've got a diagonal isomatrix that's infinite by infinite with no, okay, we're not gonna do that. So I know people were talking about a mole of moles uh, before the talk. So the idea is if we have so many uh, particles going back and forth, we have a tremendous amount of randomness. In statistical mechanics, you don't try to figure out where each particle is. You just try to figure out on average how many particles hit the wall in a small period of time. You look at every possible configuration, you average over all configurations, and then the hope is that any specific system will be very close to the system average. And we can do the same thing with matrices. So rather than writing down the actual matrix that corresponds to our system, let's just write down a large n by n matrix. Maybe the matrix has certain symmetries, maybe it's real symmetrics, complex emission, orthogonal. Uh, maybe we'll choose the entries uh, from independent, identically distributed random variables. This is how things were classically done. Nowadays, we do things with classical compact groups and Haar measure as our notion of randomness. And for each matrix, we can calculate what's the probability we chose that matrix. We can calculate its eigenvalues. And then the hope is that a typical matrix will be close to the system average. So explicitly, you know, we can put a point mass at each of the eigenvalues. And so uh, it turns out it's convenient to divide by two square roots of n. The two is not so important. It's the square root of n that's telling us how things scale. And then if I want to calculate how many normalized eigenvalues do I have in a window, I just integrate my measure from A to B. If I want to calculate the, the kth moment, I would just integrate x to the k times that. And the eigenvalues to the kth power, if I sum all of those by the eigenvalue trace number, that's just the trace of a to the k. And this gives you some idea of why this might be a subject worth investigating. The trace of a to the k is just a polynomial. I can expand it out. I can put in my probability distribution. And now I'm just integrating a polynomial against the density. There's a good hope of being able to do a calculation like this. And if your distribution is nice, if you know the moments, you should know the distribution modulo some you know, results from analysis. And so what Vignes showed is that if you take n by n real symmetric matrices with nice conditions on how you choose the entries, almost all matrices will be close to having their normalized eigenvalues following a semicircle. And the idea is to use the eigenvalue trace lemma. So the trace of a to the k is the sum of the eigenvalues to the k power, or it's you know, this you know, matrix polynomial. We want to understand the eigenvalues. But well, if we can understand the moments, we can understand the eigenvalues, and we can now pass from understanding the moments to understanding these polynomials. This is the trace formula we're going to have to find an analog of in number theory. And so this gives us immediately the correct scale to study. So if I look at the trace of a squared, it's the sum of the eigenvalues squared, it's the sum of aij squared. Well, if I take the matrix elements to be mean zero and variance one, I would expect this to be of size n squared. This is before nine o'clock, so I'm allowed to just wave my hands. And so I have n objects whose squares give me something of size n squared. So each square should be of size n, so each thing should be of size square root of n. That's the correct scale to study things. So the eigenvalue should be growing at the rate of square root of n. I can now go through and I can do the combinatorics and try to calculate what will the moments be. Uh, this is not a talk in random matrix day, so I'm not gonna go through those calculations. There's a few more details in the slides if you want to see it. A lot of combinatorics comes into play. Okay. Uh, just to give some data, you know, here is looking at 500 matrices, 400 by 400 Gaussian. You can see really good fit. Um, if I choose my matrix elements not from something with mean zero variance, one something like the Cauchy distribution, you can argue whether or not it has a mean. If somebody wants to have the argument, I'm happy to take either side afterwards. But it clearly does not have a finite variance. And you can see very different behavior. All right, so L functions. Uh, so hopefully everybody has seen the Riemann zeta function. If not, just please nod so I don't feel bad about the state of art of you know, graduate education. So just for consistency and make sure we're all on the same page, the zeta function is defined as the sum of one over n to the s, where n ranges over all the integers. It is also equal to a product over all primes. This is by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and then the geometric series formula. And the hope is there is really not that much mystery to numbers. So I'm going to put somebody in the first row on the spot right now and ask her a question. And then I'll ask somebody next to a question. What is the next integer after 2024? What number comes after 2024? Excellent. What's the next prime after 2024? 
<laughs> okay, thank you. So integers are much easier and much better understood than primes. In fact, we have an explicit formula for the nth integer. We even have an explicit formula for gaps between consecutive integers. There's really no mysteries there. So the hope is that we can somehow pass from knowledge over the integers to knowledge over the primes. Uh, the Riemann hypothesis states that all the non-trivial zeros have real part one half. It is true. I get at least one proof a week on this. Uh, instead of looking at the Riemann zeta function, you can look more generally at L functions where you replace all the ones of n to the s's with some nice functions, af of n. And we will only consider choices where we can then write this as a product over primes. And we'll see in a moment why it's so important that we can write this as a product over primes. The generalized Riemann hypothesis is that this should also have um, all of its non-trivial zeros with real power one half. I said there's lots of statistics you can look at. The first statistic you can look at is gaps between adjacent zeros. The solid line is the prediction of what would happen if you look at very large matrices. The dots is what happens when you look at zeros of the Riemann zeta function starting at the 10 to the 20th zero. Phenomenal agreement. It looks like very large matrices describe what's going on with the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. But it turns out that this is not the whole story. And to understand what's going on, I need to talk a little bit about how do we generalize the eigenvalue trace lemma. Uh, if you've ever taught complex analysis, your students hopefully learn to have a Pavlovian response. Whenever they see a function, they should automatically take the logarithmic derivative into a contour integral. This is one of the few things we know how to do in complex analysis. This is why we want a product. The log of a product is the sum of the logs. So if we take the logarithmic derivative of the zeta function and then expand it out using the geometric series formula, we get a main term, which is uh, the log p over p to the s. And then we have something else, which is uh, easily handed, handled. And now if we just do a contour integral and we shift the contour, the left-hand side is going to pull out contributions of my test function at the zeros and poles. And the right-hand side is going to be something weighted. Now we can rewrite that in a nice way by remembering, you know, what is this? Well, I can write this as an exponential and we can see that this is really just a Fourier transform. And this leads to what's called the explicit formula, which relates sums of my test functions over zeros to sums of the Fourier transform of my test function at essentially the primes weighted by the coefficients of the L functions. And so if I can understand these prime sums on the right-hand side, I can actually get information about the zeros. To understand these prime sums is very difficult. This is why number theory is not as well advanced as random matrix theory, because we can't actually do all these calculations. One of the things you notice is that the denominator, the power of P is growing. So as long as these coefficients are not too large, once we get to you know, the, the cubes of the primes, the fourth powers of the primes, they give a negligible contribution. We really only have to look at the first and the second powers. This is what you would get for Dirichlet functions. If you look at cusmal new forms, you get you know, similar formulas. Whatever L function I look at, I can get something like this. And then there's a lot of different statistics I mentioned that you can look at. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them now. You know, they're in the slides. Basically, the high-level summary is if you go far from the central point, all L functions look the same. If you are near the central point, L functions can look different. And if you've seen things with elliptic curves and the group theory that's going on there, we have reason to believe that there's a lot of action going on near the central point, and we want statistics that can pull that stuff out. So again, not going to go into all the details. The statistic we look at is what's called the n-level density due to Katz and Sarnak. And what we do is we take some test functions, phi1 through phi n, they're short, so they decay rapidly. Anything you want to do can be justified. And you scale the zeros near the central point so that they have mean spacing one. And now, almost all the action happens near the central point. But one L function no longer gives you enough to analyze. If you take one L function, you go very high up on the critical line. Well, the number of zeros goes off to infinity, so you have plenty to average over. Near the central point, you only have a few zeros. So you actually have to look at a family of L functions. You have to look at a bunch of L functions that you believe have similar properties. Maybe Dirichlet characters with the same conductor. Maybe elliptic curves coming from a one parameter family or cusp something like that. And then we average over all the things in the family. And the Katzana conjecture says that when you do this average, the behavior of the zeros near the central point looks like the behavior of the eigenvalues of matrices associated to a classical compact group. Explicitly, uh, if I do these calculations, if I do the sums over the weighted zeros, it's like integrating my test function against some function that depends only on a symmetry attached to the family. And the question is, what is that symmetry? You know, do different families of L functions have different symmetries? Yes. 
So unlike looking high up, we only see one behavior, we see different behaviors near the central point. And then if I have two different families of L functions and combine them, what does that do to the symmetry of the combination? And again, I don't want to go into too much detail. You can write everything down explicitly. Uh, this is a little bit misleading because I'm doing just the one level calculation. It gets much worse as you go higher and higher up. It's an interesting study to try to figure out how can you write this in such a way that you can actually do the calculations. Uh, the similarities, as I promised, in nuclear physics, we have energy levels. In number theory, we have zeros. In nuclear physics, you shoot a neutron into the nucleus and you see what happens. We shoot a Schwartz test function. In nuclear physics, you can only shoot neutrons with a given energy band. In number theory, we can only shoot Schwartz test functions with a given support. And so if we are unable to calculate the number theory for an arbitrary test function, we don't have full information. We'd love to send in the delta spike. And if we could send in the delta spike, we would know what's going on exactly at the central point. But the Fourier transform of the delta spike is the function that's identically one. We can't handle that. So this is the difficulties we have. What I want to briefly mention now is compound families. So if, you know, general theory going on, if I have a family of L functions, how do I determine what is the symmetry of a family of L functions? And if I have two families of L functions and combine them, what's the symmetry of the combined family? So this slide is basically just the technical preliminaries. I'm looking at standard families of L functions. What really matters is given any L function, I can write the sum of lambda over n to the s. The lambdas are associated with what's called the Sataki parameters. And lambda at p to the nth is the sum of the nth powers of the Sataki parameters. It's basically the nth moment of these parameters. So if I understand these parameters, I understand my coefficients. And I have an explicit formula which relates sums over zeros to sums over primes. And then what we noticed is that we can associate a symmetry constant. It's zero if the family has unitary symmetry, one if it is, um, I'm sorry, yeah, zero if it's unitary, one if it's symplectic, negative one if it's orthogonal. And the main result we have is because the symmetry, because the Sataki parameters of the convolved L function. So if I take two L functions, I can form a new L function by just taking the product of all the Sataki parameters. And it leads to the symmetry of the product is the product of the symmetries. So this is a really nice way of seeing very simple behavior. If I take two L functions, and there's a couple of technical conditions I have to be careful about, but in general, we know what the symmetry of the convolution is going to be. And it comes from the fact that when we expand things out, all that matters are the sums of the primes and the prime squareds. To calculate the sums over the prime squareds, if that sum is zero, it's unitary, one symplectic, minus one, it's orthogonal. This is just doing the calculation and seeing that it agrees with the random matrix theory. And the way you do the calculation is because the Sataki parameters of the convolved L function is just the product of the Sataki parameters, it just splits. And this is why we now get a nice multiplication. And you know, since I'm at a group theory conference, I can talk about a very simple group, you know, one minus one. This is where everything is coming. If you convolve with something with symplectic symmetry, you don't change the symmetry type. But if you convolve with something with orthogonal symmetry, you do flip the symmetry type. All right. Um, the future work, and this is the part for the last minute and a half that I want you to help me with, is is there a random matrix theory analog of the convolution of L functions, or is convolution fundamentally a number theory operation with no corresponding operation in random matrix theory? So again, I mentioned I had a really smart Williams thesis student many years ago, and I warned him, this is a tough problem. Don't worry if you can't do it. I have faith in you and we can shift to something else halfway through the year, we shift it. We tried lots of different things. We tried the Hadamard product, where you just multiply point-wise. We tried the Kronecker product, where if you give me two matrices A and B, I form the new matrix A tends to B, where it's A11B, and so on, and so on, and so on. We can write down formulas for what are the eigenvalue distributions of these combined families in terms of the constituents, but it doesn't model what we're seeing with the convolution. And so what I'm hoping is somebody might be able to find an operation that would be similar to that. Um, I will end with a new ensemble that we looked at a few years ago, uh, and I will leave it as an interesting exercise for anybody to figure out my sense of humor as to why this is called the disco of two matrices A and B. So we'll look at the matrix A, B, B, A, and we can ask what will the distribution of eigenvalues be of A, B, B, A as functions of where A and B are drawn from. And then, of course, you can do discos of discos because you know, disco is such a wonderful operation. Uh, this is, again, 
lots of stuff that can be done. We can figure out what the distribution of the eigenvalues are here, but it's not what we wanted. So thank you.